All right. Welcome back to the stage, Ty and Chris. Good to be here. Is your mic on? Uh, my mic is not on. There. Oh, it, it is, is on? Yep. It is. Hi, All everybody. Right. Hi, everybody else. <laughs> Have you all been blessed by the music this afternoon? Yes. It's good to see what goes on in the other departments, to see their journey. So thank you to each of you uh, department leaders and your teams for sharing that with us, either by video or in person. It's been great. As promised this afternoon, we're going to have a little Q&A time. And um, it turns out that quite a few questions landed up coming into the box. And so we have, we've done a little work. We have um, collated them, grouped them together, rephrased them, etc. Sometimes there was a bit too, too much specificity in those questions. And so we've tried to generalize them a bit more for the sake of the whole audience. There may be one or two questions that didn't make it in and we're, because of that. And we might encourage you to have a a more direct conversation with either Ty or Chris in the remaining time that they have here with us. So we're going to jump in because there's quite a few of these questions here. And I think the way we'll do this is uh, I'll ask the question and um, either of you may comment on it. Is that all right? Sounds either good to me. Either or both. Or both. Yep. You can bounce off each other. You can all right. do whatever all right. works. All right. So I want to start with this one because I think it really gets down to the heart of God. The question was that the Bible says... The Bible says uh, in the book of Revelation that God will wipe away every tear from the eyes of those who are saved. And the question is, so who will wipe away God's tears as sin and sinners are finally destroyed? Well, there, there's nothing in Scripture that, that gives us a direct answer to that question. But I would say this, that's an extremely perceptive and empathetic question. This person is um, somebody who cares about how God feels in, in this situation that we find ourselves uh, in. And I think it's beautiful to even care about that. Uh, who's going to wipe away the tears from God's eyes? Um, I want to participate in that for all eternity future. I think, that, I think that Scripture does indicate that God takes a great deal of joy in fellowship with us. And uh, I think there'll be emotional healing all around for all eternity. I, I want to be a part of it. So I think all of the redeemed would minister to God's heart in praise and worship and, and uh, testimony forever and ever. I don't know if the focus of that question is on God's tears or on the destroying of people. Can you read it again? Uh, the question part, the question part. Now, of course, we've actually uh, paraphrased this a little okay. bit. So, okay, But, yeah, so we paraphrased it as, who will wipe away God's tears as sin and sinners are finally destroyed? Yeah. You know, the book of Revelation tells us that there will be a tree in the earth made new, and the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations, which I have always thought is a testimony to how much trauma we endure on this earth. If the earth is made new, that's an end to our tears, right? That's the whole story. No more crying, no more tears, no more pain. But God, somehow the creator leaves a tree with leaves for the healing of the nation in, in the next part of our story. Which tells me the pain has been real and it's not gone like that. And it's a beautiful metaphor, and maybe that some of that healing belongs to God. God's self, actually, will be doing some healing in eternity. Yeah, yeah. I guess Isaiah 53 has a, a beautiful statement in there that at the end of it all, he regards his travail as worth it yeah, yeah. in some way. Mm -hmm. That's the value he places on the redeemed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, he, he endured the cross, right? So he's anticipating a, a great deal of joy in the future. All right, I'm going to jump in with another big one, and then we'll switch to something else. You ready for it? You sure, you, you sure you're ready for this one? No. <laughs> we're going to just say no and see what happens, Adrian. No, we're not. All right. So uh, we've heard from both of you a lot about grace and love, and we have seen the righteousness of Christ. In fact, even one of our workshops was talking about the 1888 event and message and so on and so forth. So here's the question. How does the investigative judgment fit into our understanding of the gospel? The actual, the person who asked the question was saying, I love what, I love what you guys are showing, but I don't get how that doctrine fits in to any of that. 
I don't really care. You want to go any, mini, miny, mo? Please. Um, I mean, the gospel is before and in the middle and the end of all of this conversation, so we can't even conceive of an investigative judgment that isn't already always about God's character of love, right? God's extravagant grace that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, if we think we have a doctrine of the investigative judgment that doesn't fit, we might need to rethink the investigative judgment conversations we've been having. Mm -hmm. uh, I would start there. What is the investigative judgment doctrine that you think you understand? And how is it an antithesis to the gospel? I, I would want to ask more questions, right? Amen to all of that. And I would add that the investigative judgment is a gospel doctrine. Uh, specifically in Revelation 14, the mention of the judgment is in the context of the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. If you trace that language in Revelation 14 back to its origin in Daniel 7, 8, and 9, uh, it's fascinating to me, this is at least... Uh, one part of the answer to the question regarding the investigative judgment. When you read Daniel 7, 8, and 9, judgment is against the colossal false system that has misrepresented the character of God through a salvation by works theological system. And judgment is in favor, not against, in favor of the saints of the Most High God. And so this, this idea that Somebody who believes in Jesus and has responded to his call on their life needs to be uh, in fear of the judgment, or as this question implies, that maybe, maybe the investigative judgment or just the judgment is, is contrary to the gospel is just, is just not the case. The, the judgment is, is a process of full disclosure. So we serve a God who wants all the data, all the information, all the history on the table, and, um, and part of the judgment is that every false system in history that has misrepresented God's character will be judged wanting for its failure to rightly represent the love of God. And so, so the judgment is good news in that regard, isn't it? It's good news because it is a proclamation of the true gospel over against everything that misrepresents the character of God. You are talking, I agree with this, you are talking about the judgment against evil yeah. of all, of, down through all the ages. Yeah. We have taught the investigative judgment as the investigative judgment of Ty's, Ty Gibson's soul yeah. and Pastor Adrian's soul and each of We have taught the investigative judgment as if we're all lined up right. one at a time being investigated as a very personal yeah, salvation, yeah. right? Yeah. And you are, there's, Salvation is, is always personal, but it's not individual. We've taught it as an individual. Mm -hmm. I, the way I was taught growing up in, in Adventism, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very individual thing, kind of one at a time. And the cosmic conversation about judgment, it is exactly as you've represented it. Judgment is always good news because there is a time God is going to show up and say that evil does not belong in this story. Yeah. And that's good news. Yeah. And the whole book of Revelation says there's no fence setting in the story. Evil is really bad. Yeah, yeah. Corporate evil, institutional evil, all, the, all yeah, yeah. the ways we've participated in it or it's happened to us. So that judgment is against evil. Yes. And as if that that's, there's something separate then that happens to you and I as individuals in this story. So it's yeah. a, I've received it as a little bit confused. Right, right. I, I think that that uh, if you line all of us up in the judgment, if the investigative judgment um, has to do with me and Adrian and Chris and you, um, I think the good news is that we have been judged. We've been judged, accepted in the beloved, <laughs> forgiven. Already. Yeah, so, so the judgment is good news in that, in that it is in our favor. It's, it's not against us. So the judgment simply manifests the guarantee of salvation. Yes, that'd be a great way to say it. That's a more technical way to say it, but you're a technical kind of guy. <laughs> All right, now let's, let's talk about something a little less theological, although it is, but praxis, right? Practical, All right. practical, something practically, yeah. All right, do you have any tips for parents to help their teenagers recognize God's love? Keep, keep our teenagers and our kids in loving environments. I, I wonder if kind of in the name of 
Seventh-day Adventism and having a faith tradition and being in church and raising our kids in something, I wonder if some, sometimes we lose sight of our responsibility to make sure that all of the environments our children are in are actually loving, that our churches are actually loving, that our Pathfinder clubs are actually loving, that our Sabbath school clubs, our classes are not actually counting sins but counting graces. So some of this is extremely practical. From, I, I'm not sure that I did this well when our children were growing up. We kind of dropped them off in spaces with Christians we thought understood the story and the gospel. And I realized many years later, not every space they were in was actually a loving space. And I am not talking about violence and anger and egregious you know, kinds of abuse. I'm, this is the basic. We're in Christian community. How about if we all hold the, tr the trust of our spaces that they're actually loving and Kids see that. Um, I, my wife Sue and I, we raised three children, two daughters, one son. They're amazing. They're all adults now, and they still like us. Well done. Well done. Thank you well done. for acknowledging that. Okay, so let me tell you what, 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 how, we, how we raised our kids, and we failed miserably in many regards, but, but uh, we were converts to Adventism and to Christianity, Sue and I, we were, by the way, we, Sue and I were together from the time we were 13. We got married when we were 18. And um, if, if you don't like that, tough. It's been great. We've had a great time. So we raised three children, and we didn't know how to raise kids. We didn't know anything. Both of us came from broken homes. We didn't have the slightest idea what to do. So we started reading those books that y'all gave us by Ellen White. And there were a few principles that we latched onto. And the key one was, was this. Uh, the answer is always yes, unless it has to be no. This is what we got from Ellen White. The answer has to be yes. The answer is always yes to your children, unless it has to be no. So it's a new covenant orientation in which you're raising your children on a positive premise rather than on a negative premise. The answer is yes, yes, oh, yes. The parameters are broad. You can do, you can do anything you want except for those things that hurt you and others. And then the rules are not arbitrary. The rules are grounded in the way reality operates in relationships. So that was one, one of the rules that we used. And, and our children appreciated the fact that, that the answer was always yes unless it had to be no. Secondly, we also got this from Ellen White, um, the goal of, of child raising is to throw them on the resources of their own self-governance as fast as possible. This is another Ellen White child raising principle. The goal of parenting is not control, the goal of parenting is to raise them up into responsible decision-making individuals who make good decisions on their own, which means you have to allow them to make some bad decisions on their own in order to get bitten by reality. And so it's a, it's a, it's a fine line, but, but the Lord has blessed us with those simple rules, and there were others as well. Um, so those of you who are not familiar with the writings of Ellen White, um, this might not be of significance to you, but another one that we thought was fabulous is, is uh, as far as corporal punishment goes, as, as young teenage parents, we had our first child when we were teenagers, we didn't know how to raise kids, and we read in where Ellen White said, for example, she said that <clears throat> one spanking conducted without anger should be enough for a lifetime. So we didn't spank our children except a few times early on, and I'm not even sure I would do it that way again, but I do know this. We weren't in the habit of spanking. We were in the habit of reasoning, and then Ellen White, again, I'm sorry to quote her so many times, but we were young Advents. We didn't know what to do. So, and she says that if your child, if, if a child does something wrong, that if you can lead the child to repentance, the punishment should be waived. So you should never punish a child who's sorry. Anyway, some of you are looking at me like, no, that can't be true. No, that's, you can do what you want with it. That's how we did it. I mean, all of that counsel, quite practical, right? All that counsel is extremely practical, and it all sounds like <clears throat> the biggest deterrent to our children seeing the love of God is actually their parents. 
It actually sounds like it, it's, it's me and my spouse in our home and aunties and uncles and whomever. It's actually the way we conduct ourselves as a family that could be the, the greatest risk of our children seeing the love of God. If, if I am broken by the gospel and the gospel is good news and it's great news and it's, the, and, and it's all of that and, and, and it's extra, extravagant and unexplainable and life-changing, mm -hmm. if my life is really broken by that good news, yeah. I will be a different parent than if it's not. Yeah. And then there's the influence of the community as well. So there is no yep. foolproof. Your child is going to grow up and begin making decisions as a free moral agent. Yeah. And when your children as teenagers and onward begin making decisions that you don't approve of, the exact same principles apply. Keep loving them. Remain in relationship. Um, don't allow your children to grow up in a no environment. Raise them in a yes environment and only say no when it's necessary. Awesome. Thank you. Now, Grace, Law, you and the Sabbath. five children? Yes. Yeah, come on. You have Good five luck. children. Yeah, that's right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was asking for his counsel. Not we're, we're still trying to figure this thing out. I'm listening here like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell okay. me more. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll tell you something. You don't have to have any more children. Yeah, I know. That part we figured Five's out. Five's enough. You did that, your part. That part we figured out. We've done our bit for overpopulation, and we have taken measures. Yeah, I didn't need to know. I didn't need to know. I wasn't asking. <laughs> But you did your part with the be fruitful and multiply, so well that's done. That's right, that's right. So continuing, same, this is the same vein, family, children, law and grace. How does that apply in parent-child relationships? We're going to roll the next one into that. How can parents of young children enjoy the Sabbath? Oh, the second question, how can parents of young children enjoy the Sabbath? They can't. Um, there's no good news. There's no good answer to that question. There's no good news. Tell, tell me, those of you here who parented young children, that you enjoyed your Sabbaths regularly when your children were growing. And you were the primary caretaker, gentlemen. Yeah? Yeah? I mean, I'm not mocking. I'm asking seriously, right? He enjoyed the Sabbath. Well, there's one out of a few hundred. That's good. That's a good witness. It is busy, right? It is busy. Yeah. I know it's that. It's a busy like, day for parents, for sure. Right. That's right. Even the even best way to raise your children on the Sabbath, I'm told, and I wasn't raised in Adventist, but I was told that the way you raise your children is uh, the rule is sit down, shut up, and color. That's what you tell them. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. is a struggle. It is a struggle. I know that for my wife, even here at camp, camp meeting, uh, big camp, yes. you know, it is. It's running between children's departments, yeah. trying to, um, yeah. you know, Rescue, get, the, get the ambulance to rescue one off the side of a mountain. It's um, yep. taking one to hospital. It were, like it's been a drama. And then, and that's just the older ones. Then there's the two, the two and two and three year old. You know. That's all happened to you while you've been here. Yeah. Wow. Y'all, yeah. y'all had kind of a boring camp, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah. No, no one called ambulance. Okay, so so I'm going to take this, uh, this. I'm going to take this opportunity. There's the hero over there. She's got one on her lap. That's the youngest one, at the very back there. Yeah. We we should acknowledge because I think the parent or parents that wrote that question, they're really asking, right? Sure. Is it going to be like this till Jesus comes or till they're 16 or what? Please tell us there's hope. And I've talked with a few of the young parents here who are also leaders. They're leaders in our churches. So you're leading Sabbath schools or you're leading Pathfinders or all of the things or midweek meetings. Uh, and there is no time that you're actually enjoying your own kind of mature conversation, your own opportunities for spiritual growth outside of songs for two-year-olds. And I think it's good for us to acknowledge that the life of those of us, and it's sometimes parents and sometimes it's grandparents, who take custody of grandchildren and do all of that. So it is good for us to acknowledge that all of that is happening in their lives and, and to say a good word and to continue to encourage the rest of us who have empty hands on a Sabbath. I mean, those are two empty hands that can be helping these parents with small children. There's aunties and uncles in all of our churches, right? Uh, my sister is single, um, has no children, and she's become the auntie of her church. She parks herself in row three kind of in the pew, she packs all these activity bags and all the children from the front rows end up in my sister's pew. And she kind of 
caretakes during the divine hour so that all of those parents get a quiet 45 minutes without their children. That's beautiful. So just in terms of, um, I don't know if this was the intention of the question, but some bright ideas, uh, you know, activities for Sabbath day, parents and children together, because we've spent some time talking about the fact that it is hard when, when adults need rest and Sabbath experience. So, but, but, you know, what might parents do with young children on the Sabbath day? We just spend a lot of time outside with our children, um, just hiking tromping around in the woods, looking at beautiful things, eating really good food. I love eating, and so we made the Sabbath special with food, uh, music. It's not, it's the simple things. Children are very easily pleased. I, I think just hanging out with your children on Sabbath, spending time with them outside is glorious. I, I loved it. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I think j just because raising children is challenging and difficult doesn't mean it's not fulfilling and enjoyable. You know, when my wife Sue and I, when we got married, we said, let's have 12. And then we had one and we said, no. <laughs> we lowered the number to six. And then we had two and she said, never again. Uh, and then we had our third one and we stopped there. But I loved raising our children and uh, Spend time with them outside. Do things, physical things with your children. Physical things. That, that's, that's my advice. The, the practical, that's beautiful, right? And there are simple things. And the practical reality, when we come to the end of the week, we're all exhausted. This is what I hear from our families in the States. We're simply exhausted. Um, and so for... Seventh-day Adventist Christians for whom one day in seven is different than the rest. It is a family conversation about what to do with this one day. And it is beautiful that there really aren't rules for this. Families get to create what this day looks like. It's special food. It's being outside. It's turning all the screens off. It's the rituals, whatever you create. Light Sabbath candles. Create a prayer that you pray only on Sabbath. You sing a prayer together. Small things that signal to children, oh, this is that one day that's different than all the other. It, it doesn't always have to be long lists of activities, but it certainly can't be we have to hold still, no one gets dirty, sit inside until the sun goes down, right? Like, it can't be that. I can tell you for sure, do not force your children to sit and listen to you read whole chapters out of the great controversy on Sabbath. Don't do that. I know you're inclined to do that. I can see that. <laughs> Don't, do not do that, Adrian. Do not do that. My, parent, my, my, uh, my children will be very glad of that counsel. No, I'm just kidding. We've never done that. Okay. Um, the topic of repressed trauma was raised in some of the presentations. The question is, can you recommend resources in regard to how you identify and deal with this? Well, I was referencing The Body Keeps the Score. It's a book I recommend. I would say it's one of the best books I've read in the last decade. It's by Dr. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk. The book is well worth your time. The Body Keeps the Score. That's a resource. Um, it's not particularly Christian in an overt sense, but it's Christian in principle oftentimes because the gospel, uh, the gospel is basically a description of how reality works. So any scientist who's being objective discovers the gospel, whether they call it that or not. So The Body Keeps the Score would be one resource. Another one that I think is just extremely powerful. It's a little known, but you can find it online. It's called... Uh, the life model, living from the heart that Jesus gave you. And it's a group of seven Christian uh, psychologists who have mapped out what all the periods of life look like from infancy straight through to, to the elderly years of a human being. And they've, they've just mapped out, okay, these, these are the kinds of things that should happen um, when you are an infant. And these are the kinds of life skills that are to be mastered as an infant. And these are the kind of things that will stunt your development, uh, arrest your development at that stage, and so on through the entire life. And, and, and the, the big point of the book, I mean the really big point of the book, is they point out how that, that pretty much all human beings are traumatized, that we're all trauma victims to one degree or another, that everybody has experienced some degree of arrested development, that is their maturity level has been stunted at the point of their trauma or abuse, whatever, whatever that was, 
And then the book walks you through the biblical principles that need to be incorporated in order to have those traumas heal. And the big idea of the book is that healing only occurs in community. And what has to happen in community, that doesn't necessarily have to be a big community, but, but the, the community of, the book is really big on mentorship. So it, it, it teaches, and I think churches, local churches should operate this way. My local church operates this way, where we pair people up. So, so anybody who's an adult follower of Jesus has a responsibility to nurture those who are younger in the faith as well as in years and to be mentors within the body of Christ. It's called discipleship. And, and the book is called, it's called The Life Model, Living from the Heart That Jesus Gave You. It's a, just a fascinating book. From that book, I developed a series of messages that you, you might uh, consider taking a look at where, where I've described how every single person is traumatized and that our traumas fall into two categories, violation wounds and vacancy wounds. Violation wounds are the things that were done to you that should not have been done to you. Vacancy wounds are the kinds of things that should have been done for you as a child coming up that were not done for you. So an absence of a father or an absence of affirmation or an absence of acceptance from an authority figure. Um, whereas violation wounds are anything ranging from never hearing the words I love you to angry tones as an infinite that you could not emotionally process to sexual abuse. Everything on that spectrum, those are violation wounds. And this book, uh, The Life Model, will walk you through how to identify um, your woundedness. And for those who are worried that that's too psychological and that's not biblical, the Bible is very, very much into this. The Bible very carefully, Isaiah chapter 1, describes the fact that all of us are psychologically and emotionally wounded. From your head to your foot, you're full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Not literally physically, but psychologically, emotionally, right? The Bible is really big on mental, emotional, social healing. And so this book will show you in Scripture that this is an actual thing that Jesus is concerned with and will walk you through how you can, with this book, you can teach classes, in your church, um, which, which I think is fabulous. So those are two resources I'll mention, those two books. That first book you mentioned, The Body Keeps the Score, this is kind of a thick, dense read, and I'm, I've read this book also, and I, I absolutely think it's worth our time. Just remember, it's a thick read, and you might read and reread. I think we should not let this question go. The question was about repressed trauma, right? So, so that's kind of yet to be identified, yet to be yeah. surfaced, yet to be understood and interrogated, right? Uh, we, there, there seems to be something there, but it's repressed still. And it, we should not let this question go without acknowledging we are not the social science specialists right here, that we really do have specialists available. I've talked with several of you who reach out to social services. I think you have a, some language for it here in your country. Um, where you have access to specialists and therapists, especially when we get to egregious traumas, uh, some repressed traumas that are quite egregious. And I'm, I am totally in this camp of find your professionals in your neighborhood as well. I'm not saying the scripture can't help us. I'm saying also reach out to people who know what they're doing because when you unearth a repressed trauma, it's like an earthquake happens in your home. And we need help with that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Does God consider some sins worse than others? If not, why have Christians, Adventists in particular maybe, created a continuum of sin? I mean, we know there's a continuum of sin, he says. Why have we created a continuum of sin? If all Are sin there, is equal. If all sin is equal, why do we seem to have created a continuum of sin? And why are there things we hate more than others? My words, not yours. There are things we hate more than others. You would agree. We certainly talk that way and behave that way. I, I don't necessarily think... I, I think evil is evil. <laughs> I think anything that cracks and breaks and fractures God's good story is evil and wrong. And obviously some things that happen have larger consequences and create deeper wounds, right? 
but I think the, the question has kind of a hidden implication about some things that we really just kind of deplore and we call them evil. And then we hold people to a different standard on those topics. Um, I, I don't know why we've done that, to be candid. I do know that there are just simply things that repulse us and things that we take a thus saith the Lord on from Scripture on a handful of verses. The Bible testifies lots, though, about lying and gossip and gluttony. And that doesn't seem to be as the same level of problem in a lot of our churches as some other things. Am I, am I speaking a language that's familiar in your communities? Sure. So I don't know why we've created that other than we're kind of repulsed by some things. There's shame-guilt cultures in our, in our communities and in our families. And when we do this, we simply send people into hiding and secrecy. We could do a whole camp on this talk topic, right? We could do a whole camp meeting on this topic. Um, it happens to be the last Sabbath of, of the week. That I, I don't have a good answer for why we create a continuum. Part of it is to help us feel better about ourselves, if we're honest, right? I got problems, but at least I don't have that problem. It's a very human thing. Agreed. Yeah, I think, I think we take cover from what our personal issues are by feeling very strongly about things we don't struggle with. Yeah, that's not you my know, struggle. Yeah, so. not, yeah, I don't have that issue, so... Um, if I really hate that and, and talk a lot about it, it, somehow that's cathartic for me, that's self-medicating against my own shame and guilt for whatever it is that, I, that are my issues, you know. I've noticed something over the years. I don't know how consistent it is, um, but I have noticed something over the years um, in, in my time as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is some of the, the strongest voices of judgment and condemnation, uh, sometimes whole ministries that are raised up around an issue that they're, that they're, they're fighting or condemning or judging, um, a year, two years, three years goes by and something really dark and ugly comes to the surface uh, in the life of the person who was so vocal against something else. So oftentimes people who are strongly oriented toward vocal condemnation in the name of God and righteousness. Um, not always, but, but I've noticed that, that oftentimes that is some kind of cover for something pretty dark that's going on that sometimes comes to the surface. And so as I was trying to articulate this morning, Judgment is off limits for the Christian. Judgment in, not in the, the sense of discerning right from wrong, but judgment in the sense of condemnation. It's off, off limits. Jesus said, don't do it. Just don't judge. Judge not, or you're going to be judged. And, and I think one of the reasons why we're um, commanded not to judge is because we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what a person's history is. Um, I think it's fascinating. C.S. Lewis does this amazing thing where he says, he, he explains that one person who struggles just to be in a good mood and they come across as kind of crabby and mean-spirited a lot or impatient, right? And another person um, who um, is of a pleasant, kind demeanor and C.S. Lewis works that through and says, the effort that it takes for this person with that genetic disposition to be pleasant all day long is a greater victory when it happens than the person who was born with the pleasant demeanor and doesn't even have to put forth any effort. They just bounce out of the bed every morning and say, good morning to the world. And they're happy and smiley, and they go, and we look at that person, and we think that there's greater virtue there. And C.S. Lewis says, no, there's greater virtue in the struggling person who's working against the bad hand that they were de dealt genetically. So I don't think we're in a position to judge anybody. I think we need to preach the gospel and let the gospel work things out in a person's experience and create an atmosphere in which people are free to work out their issues, 
in fellowship with the people of God, in fellowship with the church. I don't think, I, I, yeah, I personally think that, that we've done ourselves and the church and the world a great disservice yeah. by, I mean, think about it. If somebody's marriage is falling apart, they don't say, oh, man, my marriage is falling apart. You know, I, I need to go find myself a Seventh-day Adventist church. They'll understand and help me. Or are my children, my teenagers sinking into drug addiction? Boy, I need to find myself a church. Nobody who's struggling in life thinks go to the church because the church has communicated, get your act together and then come and see us. So we need to somehow reverse that narrative. So people, the first thing they think of when their life is falling apart is, man, you just need to go to the people who love Jesus because they'll help you. Right. They'll, they'll help you work through your issues. That doesn't pop in anybody's mind that I know of. So tying in closely with that, the question is, what can I do when I feel like I'm practically failing in my relationship with Jesus? Well, I, I'm not a big believer in, in focusing on the problem to solve the problem. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, right now, let's do an experiment. For 10 seconds straight, whatever you do, do not think of purple bananas. There's not a person in the room who can pull it off. You can't do it. The negation itself is contrary to the objective. So negation speech is never, is never the way to victory. So I would encourage that person to not incriminate themselves for their failure, to not focus on the failure, to not think through the failure. This morning when I said, in the name of Jesus, our sins are forgiven, that's the premise that I think we need to operate on. I'm forgiven. God loves me. Okay, so I'm failing in my walk with Jesus. Just go to where I last saw the light. Just pick up where I left off. I don't need to let it crush me. I don't need to succumb to the, I just need to pick up right where I left off. So I failed today. Pick up right where I left off last time I saw the light. Jesus never, ever is pushing me away. I imagine that I'm needing to get my act together before I can come to him. But it, it's in my imagination. His arms are open wide. Just pick up where I left off. Pick up where I left off. Pick up where I left off. As long as you keep coming back to him, you're going to discover he never moved. He was always there. Yeah. Chris? That language of, you know, I feel like I failed is worth hearing. I feel like I've failed in my relationship. Is that what the sentence? Yeah. With Jesus, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's sometimes difficult for us to acknowledge what people are feeling. Like, I feel like a failure with God and Jesus, and what does that actually mean? And then what were the markers to know you're not failing? You know, what would it look like if you're not failing, and who set up that system in your life for you? Who told you that that's what it looked like? I have days that I'm angry at God. And, and I heard some stories this week. One of the beautiful, uh, someone shared a witness with me. You know, I went to bed really angry with God, and I, I didn't even care. I'm just telling you, I'm angry. And woke up and had a, a beautiful outcome the next morning. And in other words, this is part of the journey, right? The, who, whoever told us that the journey was supposed to be a certain way and feel a certain way. Hello, little one. Oh, is that your son? You're not or is having he just some random child you're yeah, taking no, up into your arm. You're not having any more siblings in your family. It's all done. Your daddy's been snipped. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And this is being Google live, that when you're older. Live streamed across the South Pacific Division. <laughs> uh, anyhow, whoever told us, you know, what the parameters looked like and what a successful journey with Jesus looks like. And what it's supposed to feel like. I would just encourage you. We, I hear you. And, uh, uh, and whatever you think it was supposed to be, whatever you're not measuring up to, you know, we each need to create our own journey with Jesus. What, what it's like, how we can sense we're connecting with the divine. You use the language, go wherever. Was, where's the last time you saw the light or felt the light? Yeah. I mean, that is different for all of us, right? Yeah. So I have, I have a very... Um, my experience with Jesus, with God, with divinity is very diverse. It doesn't feel the same at all every day. And there are many days where I could also go to bed and kind of shake my fist at God as if I don't understand. 
Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that those are days I necessarily feel or ought to feel that I'm far from God. That's a very active faith, mm. a faith that's willing to say to God, come on, you couldn't do better than this? Mm. Or say to Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I, it's kind of dark and you seem kind of far. The end, I'm going to go to sleep. That's a very active faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, prayer and the great controversy. What role does prayer actually play in the great controversy? Uh, can God intervene in someone's circumstances? Some random guy just took your kid. <laughs> we should start praying now. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we know him. He's all right. He's okay. Yeah. Can God uh, intervene in someone's circumstances while respecting their free will? So that's the context, I think, for the great controversy prayer question. Well, I think that prayer is an act of war in the great controversy. When we think of prayer as uh, more along the lines of a trying to get God to do things he's not willing to do, um, I personally think that's a pagan orientation, God as vending machine or a genie in a bottle, and that the goal of prayer is to get God to change his mind, to get God to do things. But how about this passage? It's in Luke. Um, Jesus says, um, Simon, Simon, or Peter, Peter, Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you so that when you return, strengthen your brethren. So in that one verse, there are four intersecting wills, because that's the question here, free will. There are four intersecting wills. There's Peter. There's Satan who's doing the asking. He's asking someone, apparently God, and Jesus is the intercessor. He's praying. There's four intersecting individuals, persons, in that one verse. So so apparently there are rules of engagement in the great controversy, and I think the rules of engagement have to do with free will. So, for example, uh, this is a very simple example, but let's just say you came home this afternoon, we've, we've never ever met, you know. You come home and you open your front door and you see me sitting on your sofa eating a sandwich that I made in your kitchen. I'm, you've never seen me before, I'm a strange figure. What are you doing? You feel violated by the presence of an individual in your home on your sofa eating your sandwich material, right? And just as you're feeling violated, let's just say your husband walks out of the back room and says, oh, honey, this is my new friend, Ty. We just met earlier today. I invited him home for a sandwich. Well, everything changes because, because we operate by, by natural principles of domain or dominion or parameters. That's a shared space between a man and a woman, husband and wife, and the husband invited me in to that space and now it's okay for me to be there. So she might sit down and have the sandwich with me, right? So I believe personally that within the great controversy that I have the right, the privilege, the delegated authority under Christ, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe I have delegated authority so that if you're not looking out for yourself and your life is, you know, going reckless and weird and you're being, you know, a plaything of, of the devil, so to speak. I think I have the right as a follower of Jesus with delegated authority to open the door for God and holy angels and the Holy Spirit to have access to you even if you're not praying for yourself. So I can say, God, I want to pray for Adrian that you would tell him things today that he is not even looking for. He's not asking you into his, his space. I'm asking you into his space. And I think that, that God has access to you by the intercessor that I am on your behalf. Then I would go a step further and say that that, does not, that gives God greater access to you, but that is not the deal breaker. Greater influence will be exerted on you because of my prayers, so my prayers do matter. But your primary variable is your free will. You could still, over against all the influence that's being exerted on you, you could still, by your free will, say no. 
you could say no to that added influence that's being exerted in your life. But there is added influence, and you, you have greater thoughts can occur to you. Um, and I, I think that there's a truth to that aspect of the great controversy. So we pray for people, and it does matter. It matters immensely because we have delegated authority in the great controversy Chris? to invite people in. Invite God in. I get my, what's resonated with me is that we pray for people because it keeps our attention focused on the divine and God's dreams and God's dreams for our lives and this world and whatever comes next. I pray primarily for that reason because I need to keep my eyes on the divine um, and be reminded regularly of. What is that vision of God? What, is the dream? what are the dreams of God again? Because I've forgotten where I'm at. I've, been, I, I, I've, uh, I've gotten busy with other things. So primarily, I, I understand and it resonates with me that prayer is absolutely to keep us focused on the divine and to get clearer and clearer visions of what God's good world ought to look like. Free will is always free will. It, it, it ha in order for free will to be what it is, God can't intervene, right? Because then it's no longer free will. And in some senses, other people can't intervene for me, which is what you were just saying, because it's my, still my free will. So this is, I think these are some of the biggest and best questions in the world and in faith traditions and in philosophical systems, et cetera, because this is, this is helping us make sense of the mess that we're in. That's all, these questions are, and fifth graders can ask these questions. If God is good, why is this happening? A little bit of your sermon the other night. And when I have the whole world praying for me, why didn't it change? Yeah. We all kind of activate our prayer circles when something's going on in our family's life, right? Mm. And we get people all around the world praying for us, and the thing happens, and we give God the glory. Mm. But sometimes we activate all of our prayer circles around the world, and a thing doesn't happen. So whatever answers we come up with have to work in both scenarios. Mm. And, and, and that's why it's complicated, and it's not a two-minute question or answer, right? This is, we could do the whole camp on that topic as well. But uh, I, I, have a little, I have a little less um, trust in intercessory prayer in the exact same way that you articulated. I'm not saying we ought not to do that. I am not suggesting that it, it, there is not some other dynamic or power or reality that comes from that. And especially, have you ever been told that people are praying for you? Mm. Have you ever been told that? Sure. Have you been told that? I mean, doesn't that change you? It's, it very much impacts me. Yeah. This week, all week long, people have been saying, I'm praying for you. I'm, that changes me to know other people are praying for me. So exactly how and what are the dynamics and what's the physics and who's where and this is complicated and big and beautiful. Eugene Peterson says, you know, that the church, including prayer, is always one part mystery and one part a mess. And that's this topic. Hmm. And so I guess the bottom line is that we see in Scripture, even if we don't understand all the dynamics, we see, A, that God has asked us to pray, to pray for others, and we see Jesus himself, John chapter 17, praying for others. Mm -hmm. And so both by precept and by example, mm -hmm. even if we don't fully get it, mm -hmm. it's do there. It. It's do what, it. We do it. That's right. It's, it's a way in which we serve one another, isn't it? Yes, I, I agree with that. I still think it matters, though. Yeah, I think that prayers actually matter within a great controversy framework. Um, another way of looking at it for me that's been helpful for me, imagine a crystal clear pond. There's a mosquito perched right in the middle of it. There are five men standing around the pond with different sized rocks, different weight, and throwing them in suddenly at different velocity. So if you had infinite wisdom, and you don't, but if you did, God could calculate that the mosquito that just got toppled by the waves, Ripple. the tsunami that just hit him, from God's vantage point, he knows that it was 18.5% of the first man's medium-sized rock and 26% the effect. Do you see where I'm going with that? So we don't know exactly all of the factors that go into any particular, you know, two families drive off to church. 
and they both pray, Lord, keep us safe as we drive. And one makes it to church, and the other, the whole family ends up in a car accident, and the father's a quadriplegic. They both prayed, and the simplistic way of looking at that is to say, oh, this prayer thing doesn't work. They prayed, they prayed, God arbitrarily apparently favored these people and answered their prayer, but didn't give a rip about these people. Well, that's not, that's not true at all. There are all kinds of factors and counterfactors. You know, what, let me put it to you this way. I'm sorry to go on about this. Why did that man on that date beat my mother? Well, that man had a father who had a father who had a mother who had an uncle all the way back to 11th century Scotland, let's say, and a series of cause and effect, a causal chain. There's no way for a finite human mind to know why that car accident, that cancer diagnosis, that act of violence, there are factors and counterfactors that only infinite wisdom could calculate all of the cause and effect relationships that led to, boom, that thing happened, and in this, on this occasion, the prayers were the factor that turned it, and on that occasion, the prayers were not the factor that turned it. Here's what we do know. God is good and doing all the good that he possibly can to the degree that he possibly can, given all the factors and counterfactors involved that only he knows in both scenarios. So I can rest knowing in peace that when I can't trace God's hand, I can trust his heart. Character-wise, God is fundamentally good. So I'm not going to throw up my hands when, you know, two people were, my mother was prayed for when she had cancer. She died. Two weeks later, people were praising God in church because they prayed for their mother and she was healed. What am I, how am I supposed to make yeah. sense out of that? So the Bible is full of these stories. Yeah. And, and what we, we can say a few things, right? God is always good. Yes. We can always trust God's heart when we can't see God's hand. We can also, I think we can also say, and we can, we can agree easily, maybe we can all agree that the prayers that we're praying for good outcomes are not changing God's mind because God is always in favor of good outcomes. Mm. So when Jesus teaches us to pray, thy will be done, yeah. God's will for God's creation is good always. Yeah. And we're not changing God's mind because right. we decided to pray for it yes. or get our prayer team or our, our, our Bible study group to start praying yeah. for good things. God already wanted a good outcome. Yeah. So the gospel tells the story of the Tower of Siloam, right? The tower mm -hmm. falls, and the people ask the question, you know, about this. And Jesus said, what? Did you think, did you think their good deeds were going to keep this from happening? Right. What, what did you think? Because towers fall on people. Right. And then Jesus says that the sun or the rain come to the just and the unjust. Yes. And you're like, thanks a lot, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can there just be a formula so we can make sure the towers right. don't fall? Right. No. And there isn't. Not in this no. life. We live in a Jeffersonian universe. And in a Jeffersonian universe, free will is the factor that in any given situation that a good God knows exactly where the line is that he can't cross. I don't know in your life or in anybody else's life or even in my own where God sees right now I can have access, right now I can't. But I can know that God is good and always wants the best possible outcome and that only he in his infinite wisdom can measure when he can and when he can't do whatever he can and can't do, right? So that's where the trust factor comes in. The answer to why that cancer diagnosis, why that car accident, quite honestly, is always the same. I don't know, and neither do you. There's no way to know why that happened and why that one didn't. What we do know is that God is good and did everything he possibly could, and if the outcome wasn't what we desired, it is highly likely that the outcome wasn't what God desired. Now, if Adrian wasn't going to interrupt us, because you are, right? Almost. Are we done? Like, what the conversation we could have tonight that would be so cool, Ty, was what if God hasn't done everything God could have done? Mm. Because free will. Right. Because free will is really a thing. It is. And so God could have done something more, but humans have free will in very real and practical and tangible ways. So the good that God could do can't always be done. That's right. That's the conversation we could have after dinner. The after goodness, dinner. 
forget dinner. This is too good. We need to go on and on straight through dinner. And the goodness, the, the heart of God you're talking about there, it's rooted in what we see at the cross. If our faith is rooted in our circumstances, whether, whether, whether things are going well for me now, so God yeah. loves me, clearly we're, yeah. we're, we're in tune because everything's going well, the job, the family, the, the health, the everything. Well, all of those things are of the world, and what is of the world, the world can take away. The one thing that can never change is what you see at the cross. The cross yeah. is the one place in history where you see God acting and God acting alone, and our faith must rest mm. in determining the goodness of God on that moment in history where God and God alone is acting, and it's not the circumstances right. or anything else. Right. So now that we've got a really great conversation going, we're going to just end it there. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's Chris, fine. Chris has to get ready for a presentation. Musicians have to practice. People have to have dinner and all of that good stuff. There are still a list of questions. Those of you that have asked, you know this. There's a list of questions that I've got on my phone here that we didn't even get to, and I do apologize for that. Um, they are around a little bit longer and uh, may be able to have some individual conversations. So uh, I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads for a word of prayer, and then we will adjourn for the afternoon.